Hello and welcome to this edition of Eye on Africa. I'm Haxi Myers Belkin. Our top stories from across the continent. Promising to double the size of the Nigerian economy and create millions of jobs, opposition leader Atiku Abubakar launches his presidential bid. We'll be speaking to our correspondent in Abuja. Eight days after being rescued by a cargo ship in the Mediterranean Sea and returned to Libya, dozens of migrants continue to refuse to disembark, some saying they'd rather die than face the prospect of torture at the hands of Libyan people smugglers. And thousands of rural Malawians are flocking to the outskirts of the capital to pan for gold. Small-scale mining operations are currently unregulated in the region, but for how long? Vowing to get Nigeria working again, opposition leader Atiku Abubakar has launched his presidential campaign. The 71-year-old is a former vice president, once dogged by allegations of corruption. He initially drew scepticism when he announced his intention to run for president in February next year. But his pledge to create millions of jobs is striking a chord in a country where growth has been sluggish. For more on this story, let's cross now to Abuja to speak with our correspondent, Sam. Sam Olukoya. Hi, Sam. Just how is Atiku Abubakar planning to kickstart the Nigerian economy? Well, uh, Atiku launched uh, what he called uh, the policy document. And in this document, he talked about creating as many as 50 million jobs. He talked about, uh, and this will include women, unemployed people, uh, uneducated people, they educated, cutting across a wide segment of the Nigerian society. He talked about uh, massive infrastructural development, which will entail uh, the construction of uh, roads to the you know, of uh, 5,000 uh, kilometers, massive uh, railway construction. He was talking of human development, that you have to uh, develop uh, the manpower to be able to boost the economy. And lastly, he talked of, uh, uh, he talked of uh, increasing the inf infrastructures here, here and there. So these are the areas uh, Atiku talked of that they will potentially uh, enhance uh, Nigeria's uh, economy. A very ambitious uh, manifesto there. Just how is Abubakar's campaign being received so far? Well, it's one of mixed feelings uh, from his own party, the PDP. They said uh, he's the man to do it. He's been vice president for eight years. He was vice president for eight years. And uh, he said uh, on when he was vice president, Nigeria witnessed uh, the greatest uh, economic growth. The GDP was highest. But the ruling party said, uh, describing him as just an empty barrel, a man who is promising what he cannot uh, fulfill. Uh, they faulted his claim that he's the, the highest employer of labor outside uh, the, the Nigerian government. And they said if a man could essentially create, present false figures, then Nigerians do not trust him. So on both sides, we are seeing arguments. And I think for the average Nigerians, it's a bit difficult to know what both sides are talking about. Uh, Nigerians have had all these kinds of promises, both from uh, uh, Atiku and from the ruling party, President Mohamed Buhari. I mean, it's the time all kinds of uh, promises have been made. And for some Nigeria, it's like uh, a repetition of what they have seen over, over the past years. But both sides want to convince Nigeria Nigerians that uh, they have something to actually deliver. Sam Olukoya in Abuja, thank you very much. To Libya now, where dozens of migrants are refusing to disembark a cargo ship that rescued them from the Mediterranean Sea over a week ago. Some of those aboard the Nivin have told journalists they'd rather die than be forced to return to Libya, where they say they endured torture and forced captivity at the hands of people smugglers. Our correspondents James André and Julie Dungelhoff were at the port of Misrata this weekend. They sent us this report from Tripoli. 
Now, what's happening right now in the port of Misrata is a first in this migrant crisis. A group of 79 migrants are refusing to leave the boat that brought them back uh, to Libya after saving them in the Mediterranean Sea. They are sealed themselves inside the boat. They have steel bars, fire extinguishers, and they say they will not set foot on Libyan soil. Now, it's a standoff between them and, on the other hand, port authorities, local authorities and riot police who are in the port trying to convince them to come out of that boat peacefully. They have, in effect, created a wall around that area of the port with freight containers. They are barring all media, including ourselves, been trying for two days to access the zone uh, from actually uh, managing to get to the boat itself. And the situation on board is pretty dire. We have managed to uh, get a testimony through WhatsApp you can have a look. I'm from Eritrea. I'm 16 years old. Uh, I stay in Libya from 2016. They pay me. They sold me three times. They punish me. Even I have my brother died in my hand in Pinwali. I saw so many things. How I can go down? If I go down from this boat, they can kill me. They can do anything, but I will not go down. Even they didn't give me a food. They didn't give anything. This is my decision, not only my decision, all our brothers, all the 79 that they are here, we will not go down until we die. We need a solution, we need a solution, a fast solution, because we are in bad condition. Humanitarian organizations uh, have been granted access by the Libyan authorities. They've been assisting the migrants medically, but also for food and water, and they say the situation is deteriorating. They suffer from psychological problems and they never see daylight because they are stuck in the cargo ship. The living conditions in there are terrible. There are no showers or toilets. There are people with infected wounds and the situation is deteriorating. The Libyan authorities are trying to find a peaceful solution. They are negotiating with migrants and are helping us work. The Libyan authorities are struggling to find a solution to this crisis, which poses a number of questions as far as international law is concerned, both for the Libyans but also for countries in the European Union. James Wondre reporting from Tripoli there. Kenya has banned Mary Stopes International from providing abortion services in the country. This after pro-life campaigners and some members of the public complained that a radio advert by the charity was promoting terminations. Mary Stopes denies the allegation, insisting its campaign was simply promoting awareness about unsafe abortions. Abortions are illegal in Kenya unless the woman's life or health is in danger. A rural gold rush is underway in Malawi. Ever since gold deposits were discovered on the outskirts of the capital last year, small-scale miners have been flocking to the area, hoping to get rich quick. The government, meanwhile, says that the mining operations are illegal and is vowing imminent regulation. Nicolas Germain has this report. Buenzi Kalima used to be a guard. But, like many other Malawians, when he heard recently that gold had been discovered outside the capital, he rushed to the area. The gold found here is currently fetching around $34 per gram. Before, my low wages meant that I was living hand to mouth. I was very poor. But with this gold mine, things are changing. I'm helping my family and things look promising. Malawi is periodically hit by severe food shortages and power outages. Looking for gold is hard work, but it's proving to be a lifeline for many poor Malawians. I come here every day. I make enough money now, between 15 and 50 dollars a day, and that's how I'm helping my family. But this free-for-all doesn't look set to last. For the moment, Malawi does not regulate artisanal and small-scale mining, but the government says this is about to change. It's an illegal activity which is now taking place in Malawi, and we don't want it. That's why we're, 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 we say at some point they'll be ejected out of those places unless they follow the laws of the country. The small-scale gold miners will be sad to hear the authorities say a bill is expected to be tabled in Parliament before the end of this year. 
Mauritania has qualified for its first ever major football tournament after beating Botswana 2-1 in a whack shot to claim a place at next year's Africa Cup of Nations. It was a busy day for qualifications, with Algeria also securing a spot after a 4-1 victory against Togo. Guinea, meanwhile, has qualified even before their game against the Ivory Coast, when Rwanda and the Central African Republic drew 2-2 in Kigali. The Ivory Coast is also through. A one-all draw was all they needed to secure their spot in the tournament. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Eye on Africa. Thank you very much for watching. There's more world news coming up in just a few minutes. Do stay tuned. France 24, every art form. Business news is not about numbers, nor percentages and statistics. Business news is about people and how we live our lives. People and profit goes beyond numbers to analyze how the global flow of money and profits shape our world. Intelligent and accessible, the show cuts across business, economics and politics. People and Profit, presented by Stephen Carroll on France 24 and France24.com.